Today we've got the lecture slides and on the website there's a little worksheet on syntactic structures we're going to work with a bit in class today. First, syntax, uh, theories, trees, and other forms of torture. I'm going to walk you through just a little bit of theoretical background first about syntactic structure, just the basics, then we'll kind of talk about, okay, what does that mean for actual structure of real languages? Different kinds of word orders and sentence orders in different languages. First, just some review. So just to review some common problems in the uh, quiz or with things like phonemes. So what's a phoneme? So it's a, a minimal unit of sound. It's like a sound category. So it's a distinctive sound in the language. It's a distinctive sound in the language. It's, it's a distinctive sound in the sound system of a language. It is one that you would identify as a sound. You wouldn't identify individual allophones of that phoneme as distinctive sounds. A native speaker would say, oh, that's the sound of my language. A is the sound of English. O is the sound of English. Ch is the sound of English. Sh is the sound of English. And of course, you test them by doing minimal pair tests. You contrast it with other sounds. And if it changes the word, it changes the, it to a different word. Uh, that's a way of testing for a phoneme. So it's a sound unit of a language. And it can, for some languages, it can include maybe lexical stress, word stress. Uh, not often, but there are a few cases where, for example, subject, subject, object, object. There are a few cases where word stress um, makes a difference. Uh, so some, many would argue that word stress in English is a phoneme, as well as vowels and consonants. Usually we talk about vowels and consonants as phonemes, sometimes word stress. Um, some tone languages like Chinese, tone is uh, phonemic, uh, ma, ma, and such. What is, what's the difference between descriptive and prescriptive grammar? So prescriptive means, it's the traditional view of grammar. Prescriptive means there's one proper way to speak and write English, and it's my way. And with English, for example, it's probably going to be the English spoken by educated, middle, upper class, white, urban people in the US and Canada. And, and so it's rules in the traditional sense, like you have to do this, you can't do that. You cannot use double negatives. You cannot use ain't. You have to say things in a certain way. And if you don't, it's wrong. And the problem is many people speak dialects. So imagine an African-American kid, and this used to happen, maybe not so much today, but a long time ago, an African-American kid in a school in the U.S. And the African-American kid does an assignment writing in the grammar of his or her dialect. It could also be a white hillbilly kid also, an educated kid from like a rural environment, but more often it happens with blacks. The black kid writes an essay using African-American grammar or black English and the teachers in the school try to force him to write white English and he, he can't or he doesn't. There's resistance, again, because of racism. So this, these poor kids get put into a lower level class. They're treated like they're, they're dumb or intellectually inferior. This is dialect discrimination, particularly has happened with against African Americans or people who speak other varieties of English. And that's the problem with prescriptivism. And also the rules of Traditional prescriptive grammar are often arbitrary, like don't split infinitives. We split infinitives all the time to boldly go where no one has gone before. They're arbitrary. There's no historical basis for them. Or sometimes the rules that they teach are just old style. No serious linguist believes in prescriptivism. Whether they're Chomskyan generative linguist or uh, people doing pragmatics or people doing an alternative theory of grammar, like cognitive grammar, cognitive semantics, or functional grammar. No matter what theory you follow in linguistics, no serious linguist would insist on prescriptive grammar. Linguists believe in a descriptive approach to grammar. We treat all grammars of all varieties or dialects as equal. They're all equally worth studying and equally interesting and equally complex. We do not believe in elitism, where we say one is better than the others. We do recognize that, of course, for formal English, yeah, you. Uh, naturally follow formal English grammar. And I teach an academic writing course where we teach you know, formal English style. But this is like a, a set of conventions that we've agreed upon. If you want to communicate to formal academics, you use this style. And there's nothing wrong with teaching these rules, but these are 
just descriptive rules. These are conventions or standards. If you want to communicate to a professional academic audience, you write this way, you talk this way. If you want to, com um, if you want to communicate to people who are not academics, yeah, you would use informal English or even dialect. You wouldn't want to, you know, who'd want to listen to rock and hip hop uh, sung in formal English? That would be boring, wouldn't it? Nobody wants to hear the Rolling Stones sing, I don't have any satisfaction. No, it sounds cooler when they say, I ain't got no satisfaction. So linguists are descriptive in their approach, uh, not prescriptive. Now there are other things like universal grammar and, and such, which we'll talk about in a minute. But prescriptive means enforcing rules like it has to be this way and it can't, you can't deviate from that. Descriptive is we describe language as it is. We take it for what it is and we analyze it. As Chomsky said, the native speaker is always right. Each native speaker has a grammar, uh, maybe uh, the grammar of the, their variety or dialect. Maybe they also have a slightly different grammar in their heads for the standard when they switch to standard style. Like at work, you speak standard English, and at home, you might speak your dialect. All cool. So linguists believe in uh, treating all dialects or varieties of languages as valuable, and we just want to analyze and we want to describe and analyze them as they are because they're all valuable and we don't believe in the linguistic elitism. Uh, let me jump into syntax. I'm going to kind of review. So the Chomsky and generative framework, it really has kind of several theories that kind of go together and they kind of overlap. So there's universal grammar, which is the idea that there are these all human languages and all humans in their brains and their minds have a set of grammatical principles or parameters. Parameters are things you can kind of go this way. Or it's like I can, like, you can, you know, set your uh, thermostat for like 20 degrees or 22 degrees. It's like a parameter. You can switch it this way or that way. So all human languages have kind of the same kind of set of principles or parameters, and they're kind of abstract structures generally, and each language chooses from one. And this partly explains how a child would learn the first language. A child has these principles built in when born, and the child uses them to kind of discern and learn the grammar. It partly explains how children would learn the first language. More on that later after the midterm when we talk about language acquisition. Generative grammar is another related theory, again, that the grammar of all languages are defined by these abstract rules and parameters, universal, and that these rules or parameters can generate, that is, explain all possible things that a person could say in a language. That any possible sentence would be described or explained and analyzed by a particular set of abstract grammatical principles. And if you wanted to learn more about that, you can take like a syntax course later on. And Every native speaker, you could ask them, is this, is this, is this then it's possible? Or would you say that? And they could say yes or no. Then the particular syntactic theory, again, not all linguists believe in all of these, and some linguists reject certain parts of them. Uh, particularly this stuff is a little more controversial. Particular Chomsky syntactic theory. <laughs> Sentences have like a, a surface form where it comes out of your mouth, but behind it there's some abstract structure which explains um, certain things and their constituents and hierarchy. So I don't know if you can see that uh, the diagram, I created it, uh, it has a transparent background. So can you see that diagram, that tree structure there? Can you see that? Well, or just like this. It, the same thing is true for morphology. There's like an abstract structure in, in morphology or in syntax, the word order of sentences. So for example, if you can write on the board, you have a sentence and then you have a noun phrase, a noun phrase and that's dogs. And then you have a verb phrase, which includes the verb and the stuff that comes after the verb, the predicate, and a verb, which is chase. And then you have another noun phrase, which is the object, which is squirrels, dogs chase squirrels. Uh, so sentences are defined by this kind of abstract structure. So there are constituents, like there's a noun phrase, a verb phrase, a verb phrase, a sentence. These are different constituents, that is, different syntactic phrases. And there's a hierarchy. A verb phrase is kind of a hierarchy over the individual verb and then the stuff after the verb, the predicate and such. And then the theory defines particular characteristics of these, which we don't need to worry about in this class. Then particularly in the Chomsky framework, there are transformations or movements or whatever. John is eager to please. And so at one level of 
abstract representation. John is actually the patient, the object of please, but then John moves over to the subject of is. And again, this particular, the syntactic theory of Chomsky has undergone rebranding and a number of revisions. It's now called minimalism. Don't worry about that. I, I don't expect you to, do, to know movement or do movement. That's not appropriate for freshmen unless, you know, it'd be a good torture method, you know, to make students do like syntactic movements and such. But no, it's really theoretical and it's not relevant to us. So again, there's another example of phrase structure, kind of simplified. Um, and constituents, things like you have noun phrases, you have prepositional phrases, uh, and, and others. The way you can test that something is a constituent, you, if you can move it and, and things kind of stay the same. So questions like you have gone, have you gone? So have and you, they move and, you know, so the subject and the verb are not the very same constituent, they're different things because you move them like when you make questions. Again, don't worry too much about this. I'm not going to make you learn these constituency tests, but these are just ways that syntacticians have of testing to see if this is a constituent, does this belong together in the tree? Did the dogs chase squirrels? And that kind of shows, well, the subject and the verb are not exactly in one constituent. They're different things. And, or clefting. So it's uh, I want the dark chocolate. Oh, it's the dark chocolate that I want. And you can move things around by clefting. Clefting itself is a kind of movement. Question formation is a kind of movement. You move things, you move it in English, you move uh, an auxiliary verb in front or put one there, insert one, uh, to form a question. And that's an example of movement. And it also shows that subjects and the verbs are different constituents, they're different things. And then pro forms, do you want to? Like, do you want to go? Do you want to? So you can substitute something with a pro form, like a pronoun. So do you want to means like, do you want to go? So the to is substituting for go. Do you want to go? Yes, I want to. Yes, I have. Have you gone? Yes, I have. There they have is functioning like a pro form. Uh, I don't think so, and I like it there. OK. OK, so movement, yeah, we talked about that. John is easy to please, so at one level, John is after please, but he moves to the beginning of the sentence. Again, not all linguists believe in this movement stuff. I myself don't believe it, but it is a convenient way of describing different sentences and describing the abstract structure, even if I don't believe that this actually happens in your head. And it's a convenient way of talking about how different sentences or sentence structures are related to each other. But I, you, don't, you don't need to know about movement in this class. Another way of showing this kind of structure is to use to write in an old phrase structure rules. This is something that linguists used to do a long time ago. So this is a way of showing some things about uh, the phrase structure of sentences, a uh, phrase like constituent structure. Uh, a sentence, an S, can consist of an, an NP, a noun phrase, and a VP, a verb phrase. A VP can consist of a verb and or a verb and a noun phrase, like an object. An NP consist of, can consist of like a specifier. Um, so don't worry too much about that terminology. A specifier would be like this, that, these, each, every, all, the, a. <coughs> optionally a specifier, optionally a modifier, like an adjective, like uh, red balloon, the red balloon. So the is a specifier, red is a modifier, uh, a balloon is a noun. And you can have an adjective phrase, so she felt very sick, where you can, an adjective or an adjective with an adverb modifying it, that's an adjective phrase. I think that's in your book. Here's some others. A noun phrase can consist of a noun phrase and a prepositional phrase. That's another kind of noun phrase. The cat on the mat. And the prepositional phrase consists of a preposition and then a noun, or a noun phrase. And a noun phrase can also consist of a noun and a relative clause, like the cat that sat on the mat. Uh, and the relative clause includes a relative pronoun, and then a, sen a, a clause. We use s also for a clause. This is like a sentence. And what does buys us is something called recursion. Because uh, kind of like in computer science, one function that can call another function, that can either call itself directly or indirectly, it's called recursion, so you can keep going on and on with embedding. So because, so preposition phrase, noun phrase, preposition phrase, noun phrase, 
So what this allows, for example, the dog chased the cat, the chased the rat, the chased the frog, that chased the fly. You can go on and on like that. You can just stack relative clauses like that, on and on, as much as you like in, in the language. I know that you know that I know that you know that I know that you know what I did. You can keep going on and like that. And some, sometimes comedy movies will do cheap play with this kind of structure. The flea on the net, maybe three, something from a children's story, maybe the cat, the flea on the net, on the rat, on the cat, on the dog, on the pig, and so on. You can stack prepositional phrases. So what this stuff buys you, this phrase structure stuff buys you, is the ability to do recursion. And that's one property generally of, of human language. There's been a little controversy about this lately because according to universal grammar, it's at least something that's available to all languages. And it seems uh, that all languages would probably do this. A few years ago, an anth a linguistic anthropologist claimed to have found a language in the Amazon that doesn't have any recursion, like no relative clauses, or uh, like, I know that you know, that's a complement clause. I'll give you the word later, a complement clause. So he claimed that this language doesn't have any recursion like this. And that's a controversial claim. It's still, I guess, awaiting, we don't know for sure if he's, if he's correct about that, maybe he is, but uh, he's claiming, well, that's a problem for universal grammar. and. Well, is it? I don't know. Depends on how you interpret universal grammar. Does, it, does universal grammar mean you, a language has to say, OK, let's have recursion in the language. Does language have to do that? Or is it just an option that languages would likely select, but not necessarily? It's kind of an ongoing debate. But it would be, I mean, you can, you, there are some languages that don't do this a lot. So I mean, that's, you could have an infinite regress or recursion of dependent and independent clauses. So, so a dependent or main clause is a main clause sentence. You can join two main clauses with something like and or but. The cat chased the dog and the wolf chased the rabbit. And you can go on and on like that. And you can also include dependent or subordinate clauses, a jong suk chol, something that, uh, like with although or since or because, which cannot be a complete sentence by itself, a dependent clause. So. You could say, oh, the, the dog chased the cat because the dog was angry at the cat, and the wolf chased the rabbit because the wolf was hungry, and so on. You could go on and on and like that, with recursively putting in, stringing in clauses into one super huge sentence. Uh, there's no limit, uh, except that our reader's probably going to get sick and tired after a while of reading that. Uh, and your editor will probably scream at you and tell you to write normal sentences. You could go with modifier stacking. I could pile on as many adjectives as, you, as I want to in front of a noun, like the very ugly, cheap-looking, dirty old wooden brown and red French sofa. You could go on and on like that uh, until the editor you know, screams at me and says, Ch change this into a normal sentence. People can't read hugely long sentences like that. We often do recursion like the dog, the dog chased the cat, they chased the rat, they chased the frog, or the rat that the cat you could say the rat that the cat caught died, but can you say that the rat that the cat that the dog chased caught died? Here you're doing recursion or embedding in the center of a, of a phrase, and that's really hard to process. So humans don't like that. Maybe a robot would understand that, you know, like an Android or Borg, and you have plenty of RAM memory in your mind. You can handle that, sure, but not humans. Computer geeks like to play with recursive acronyms, so. Uh, PH P stands for PHP Hypertext Preprocessor. That's what it stands for. GNU stands for GNU is not Unix. Lame means lame ain't an, an MP3 encoder. Syntactic ambiguity. A cop knock, just knocked on my, a police officer, a cop just knocked on my door and told me the dogs are chasing people on bikes. I told him, that's impossible. My dogs don't even own bikes. So the ambiguity is on bikes. Is it on bikes modifying people? Or does it modify uh, dogs chasing? Ambiguity. A famous example from a famous American comedian. I once shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I'll never know. So first you're thinking, I was wearing pajamas and shot an elephant. And, and then the joke turns it over to an elephant in pajamas. So these two interpretations would have two different syntactic structures, where one, um, I was wearing pajamas and I shot an elephant uh, wh while wearing pajamas, or an elephant uh, in my pajamas, an elephant that was wearing my pajamas. 
So this phrase stru structure can help you explain ambiguity. There are two different structures in these ambiguous sentences. Uh, now, an interesting point about this in syntax is these elements, like this is a constituent right here, and this has a head and a non-head. So remember back with morphology, things like hand chopper? This is the head noun of head and hand chopper. And you can use the same diagram, tree structure diagram for morphology as for syntax. This is the head noun. This thing is a noun phrase because the head noun is a noun. And this is the most important part of this in terms of the meaning. It's a chopper where this is by hand. And on top of that, you've also got the semantic rules. White House, this is an adjective, but because this is a noun, the whole noun phrase is a noun. And this is the most important part semantically and structurally of this compound word, White House, which is, by the way, different from Romance languages. Oh, I don't have it over here. Uh, in Romance languages, most often they don't do compounds like this. They would say like chopper with a preposition like de or por in the hand. Uh, I don't know how to say it in Spanish exactly, but uh, romance languages don't do compounds like that as much. Uh, instead, they go with kind of uh, short, simple prepositional phrases with no article. The same is true in, in syntax. So for example, this here is a VP or verb phrase. And the verb is the head. Uh, it's the most important part. And so this is a VP because the head is a verb. And then this part here is kind of a complement. or. So you've got a head and a non-head. And there are different kinds of non-heads. And it's not important that you know the different kinds of non-heads. That's kind of more technical stuff. But this is like a complement, like an object uh, of, of the head. Or you could have a specifier like the dogs. And the is a non-head. And dogs is the head of the noun phrase in, in most theories uh, of, of syntax. For English, the verb phrase is left-headed. The main element is here. This is the head of a verb phrase. So this kind of verb phrase, a verb object verb phrase, anyway, a verb object verb phrase or verb predicate verb phrase, the head is the left. And you can turn around and you get a different grammar that's not English. Or if I say the dogs, so noun phrases in English are usually uh, right-headed. It is a noun phrase because the main part, the head, is the noun, which is on the right. And in different languages, though, you get different configurations. You can turn them around and get a different grammar. So in English, the big black spider caught a juicy fly. Again, I, was, I guess I was hungry when I wrote this. Or in Spanish, a few adjectives might go before the noun, like la gran araña, araña spider, and gran is big. But most other adjectives go after the noun, amaria, so araña amaria. Uh, and it's kind of like, like with French sofa, wooden sofa, a property that's more inherent to the noun. In English, is right before it. And for Spanish, uh, only adjectives that are really an inherent property uh, or, or certain things go before the noun. Atrapó, caught. Una mosca jugosa. So mosca is fly, jugosa, juicy, adjectives. Most adjectives in Spanish go after the noun, and for French and Italian also. A few adjectives might go before the noun um, in special cases. So, and so this gets us, gives us different word orders. Oh, sorry, Korean is, I should change this. Korean is what I call SOV, where you have subject, then object, and predicate, and verb at the end. You know that. English is SVO, subject, verb, object. Um, German is SVO, but subordinate clauses, relative clauses in German are different. They are SOV. And this, so this is the main clause, and then this is the relative clause, and the verb goes at the end of a relative clause in German, uh, and a dependent clause. So uh, German is kind of interesting in that way. So how do we get these different word orders? You can play with the tree structure Let's try something. If you go to this, uh, on the website, there's a link to the syntactic structure worksheet. And if you could look at that, discuss this in groups. So for the relevant parts here, like sentence structures, English has it, you know, has it this way. You can see that uh, for certain kinds of 
phrases, like verb phrases, noun phrases, preposition phrases, uh, they're either left-headed or right-headed. That is, the main part is on the left or the right. What happens if you switch it? Uh, so you don't have to understand how these tree structures work. That's not important. Or what different kinds of non-head elements there are. Don't worry about that. What I want you to do is just talk to each other. Look at these examples for English, and then what happens if, for the relevant part in each item? What happens if you switch the head and the non-head around? What if you flip them? You get a different kind of grammar. And what kind of language maybe does that? So take a look at this little worksheet. Um, discuss this for a few minutes. Uh, and uh, if you know other languages, this would maybe be helpful for you. So talk. Uh, look at this, open this little document, and look at the examples and talk to each other. So just look at the relevant parts of the syntactic tree. Don't worry about everything else, and don't worry about how to, you don't need to know how to draw syntactic trees for this class. You don't need to know how to draw this stuff, or how they, how, how they work. Just look at the relevant parts, and then talk about what happens if you switch them. Switch the head and the non-head. So get into groups and talk for a while. So now I'm going to go over the syntax worksheet and recap our classroom discussion and some of the insights from uh, my students. In number one, we have the general sentence structure of a basic sentence. We have a noun phrase subject, like dogs, and we have a verb phrase. And the verb phrase includes the main verb, and the verb elements, and then objects or other things in the predicate. So chase squirrels is the predicate. In English, the main node, the sentence node, is right-headed because the verb phrase is the dominant element, and the noun phrase, the subject, is on the left. And within the verb phrase, the verb phrase element itself is left-headed because the main verb is on the left and objects are on the right. So it's a verb phrase because the verb element is the head of the verb phrase. So in English, dogs chase squirrels. That's subject, verb, object, or SVO, and many Western languages are SVO. That is a very common pattern in the world. Now, Korean would do ch dog, squirrels, chase, S-O-V, subject, object, or predicate, and verb. And many Asian languages do that, S-O-V. So majority of languages in the world are S-O-V or S-V-O. Now, if you flip these two structures, if you play around with these, you flip the uh, the verb phrase so that the verb phrase, the VP, is right-headed. That gets you the Korean and Japanese word order, the dog, squirrels, chase order, the SOV order, just by flipping that verb phrase into a right-headed verb phrase. If you flip these two levels, the S and the VP nodes, in other ways, you can get different configurations. You could get chase squirrels, dogs, chase dog squirrels, Chase dog squirrels, it's V S O. Chase squirrels dogs, V O S. And you can get other you can get other exotic patterns. Those are not very common in the world's languages, but there are a few languages that have those other patterns. For example, uh, when the students in class today m t informed me that <coughs> Mongolian uh, Mongolian is primarily S O V, like Korean and Japanese, but occasionally you can have chase dog squirrels, which is VSO for definition sentences, a definition of what a dog is. Why, when a language maybe primarily uses SOV or SVO, occasionally a language might use another structure for certain expressive purposes. Squirrels, dogs chase, I could say if I'm emphasizing squirrels or something like that, there's a special emphasis there in English. But primarily it's, this is the pattern of English here dog chases it or the dog is chasing it on the right side. Here we have a pronoun and if you reverse the verb and the pronoun so that the, the verb phrase is right-headed only when it's got a pronoun object, well that is the pattern of Spanish and French romance languages. The dog it chases in Spanish and French. The object pronouns go before the main verb. Next within noun phrases number two so we have a specifier so a specifier is a function word modifier of a, in this case, a noun phrase. Things like the, a, an, each, every, all, some, etc. And then another kind of non-head is a, uh, here in this case, an adjective modifier. So the brown dog, that's the standard English pattern. 
if you switch the adjective and noun so that the NP2 is instead of being right-headed like in English you get a left-headed phrase so you say the dog brown and that is the pattern again in Spanish and French and Italian in Romance languages. The noun phrase in English is right-headed but with respect to the adjective in Spanish and French it's left-headed. Now the specifier is in most languages I know of on the left, the left non-head element. We have a head element and a non-head element and there are different kinds of non-head elements like specifiers and for this class that's not important. Uh, you just need to know head, non-head. I'm not aware of a language where the specifier or at least some specifiers like the come after the nouns where the specifier part is on the right where that the NP1 is left-headed although I've heard of a I think there is there are a few languages that do that but I cannot remember what they are there are a few languages that can put at least some specifiers after the noun but I can't think of an example right now number three adjective phrases very interesting it is of course right-headed the main part the head is the adjective and the adverb is the non-head Pretty much standard in many languages. Uh, one of my students though told me that in Arabic, while both are possible, although the right-headed version is less common than the left-headed version. So in Arabic, it's common to say interesting very, while very interesting is possible, it's more common to say interesting very. And that I thought was very interesting. I've never heard that before. Next, prepositional or postpositional phrases. So really, the only difference between a preposition and a post position syntactically is that the postposition is on the other side of the the constituent the phrase constituent so the spider in the web or in languages like Korean and Japanese in the web spider or web in being spider so the preposition simply comes after the noun so that in English the preposition is left-headed and in Korean and Japanese it's right-headed uh, relative clauses number five so there are several different kinds of relative clauses here. I'm showing the two most common. There is the subject relative, where the relative pronoun is the subject of the lower or the lower clause, the relative clause, that ate the steak. That's the subject of ate, so the dog that ate the steak. The object relative is where the relative pronoun like that is the object of the relative clause, dog ate. And so clauses are S in the syntactic tree. So that's an object relative, the steak that the dog ate. So in English, these relative clauses, well, they are left-headed with respect to the relative clause phrase, and the NPs are left-headed. So the overall main noun phrase is left-headed. The dog is on the left of the top noun phrase and within the relative clause the relative pronoun makes it a relative phrase and so that's on the left. If you switch these if you make a mirror image then you get for example the order in Korean so in Korean it's um, eaten steak dog and dog eaten steak so in Korean the relative clause is before the noun and there's not a relative pronoun, but instead you use a participle form of the verb in the relative clause. And in Korean, a participle is really the same as a relative clause. There is no distinction between a relative clause and a participle phrase in Korean. They are the same. In English, they are different because in English we use a relative clause pronoun. In Chinese, it's also reversed kind of like Korean, except in Chinese there is a function word, a sort of structural particle, da, that's used instead of a relative pronoun, but again, it is reversed. So, ate the steak, da, dog. So, da is that structural particle, or dog ate, da, steak. So, Chinese is also reversed, but with the structural particle. Uh, number six, complement clauses. So, things like, I know what you did last summer. The top VP, if it is, so in English, it is left-headed, and the complement clause branches out to the right. Switch that around, reverse that, and you get the Korean, which is I, 
you did last summer what? Also, the lower complement clause flips. No. And no is at the end. So the subject of the main sentence, the main verb, I, still first, if you express that, if you say that, you don't have to say it in Korean. And then, you did last summer what? N no. There are other languages, I, th I think my student said in Mongolian, you can do both, but it's more common to say, you did what last summer? I know. So apparently that's possible in some languages if you flip the top sentence note also. Uh, main verbs and auxiliary verbs. Um, their train has just departed, so one of my Spanish-speaking students told me that the has and just in Spanish are in different order. They're, they're reversed. The train just has departed. And then you can see another difference if you put in objects or other stuff in the predicate. You get the German pattern, which is unique. So in German you say, Ich habe das Flugzeug gelandet. I have landed the airplane, but what you literally say is, I have the airplane landed. So an auxiliary verb, an inflected verb goes after the subject in German, so it's still SVO. Then you've got an object or predicate, and then participles or dependent infinitives or other stuff at the end, gelandet. So the order of object and auxiliary is flipped in German, and it's really unique. This is basically what the syntactic structure, um, the syntactic trees, the phrase structure, the hierarchies, that's what they do for us. This is what they give us. They allow us to explain these different kinds of word orders in sentences. And for example, you can have different word orders for different kinds of verbs, different kinds of objects. So we saw an example, regular noun objects in Spanish are like English, but a pronoun object goes before the verb. So you can have different structures for me, different kinds of verbs or different contexts, different expressive purposes different kinds of nouns or different kinds of objects and so on. So there are all these structural elements and you can just change them, flip them around or whatever, and you can create all kinds of different grammars, all kinds of different grammars of a language. And so this is how you can easily get thousands of different grammars for the 7,000 languages that exist in the world. Well, conceivably, you could when consider other possibilities, other complexities here. There's a lot of stuff we haven't covered. You could probably get millions of different possible grammars, different kinds of sets of rules or parameters for different word order orders. So these are parameters. Whether you have, for example, a right-headed or left-headed noun phrase, or right-headed or left-headed verb phrase, these are the parameters within universal grammar. And so a language can select for one. So let's say for noun objects, I want left-headed verb phrase when I have a noun object, but a right-headed verb phrase if I have a pronoun object and or whatever. So these are different parameters or sort of settings that language languages can choose from. And that's what we what we mean by parameters. And this is the idea of generative grammar and universal grammar, that you've got this kind of universal structure with different possibilities, different settings, you can change things around and get all kinds of different possibilities for all kinds of different grammars of all kinds of different languages. That is, I think, basically what you need to understand for this course, uh, for this chapter, for this unit on syntax. If you want to know more, it's interesting. Uh, well, I'd recommend you take a syntax course or courses in syntax and related areas in your future and explore this more because it is quite fascinating. So that is it for syntax and after the midterm we will start talking about pragmatics. So see you later.